Hi everyone, welcome back to the ninth lecture in the immunology series. Last time we looked at how B cells achieve their diversity and the structural properties of antibodies. In this lecture, we are switching gears back to cellular immunity again and taking a closer look at how T cells develop and recognize antigens. Now, this lecture has a lot of ties with lecture 6 that we discussed two weeks ago, so keep that in mind. Here are the lecture objectives of this lecture. Basically, we will first take a second look at the clonal selection process. Then we will look at receptors and co-receptors in T cells. Lastly, we will take a deeper dive into MHC molecules and specifically gain an understanding of the HLA or human leukocyte antigens. So let's get started. We will begin this lecture by first revisiting the concept of clonal selection and how it helps to ensure T cells can distinguish self and non self. Remember, T cells like other white blood cells, they originate in the bone marrow, but unlike others, they migrate to the thymus as immature thymocyte and mature in the thymus. Now, in the thymus, T cells get selected to make sure they can interact with self MHC molecules. This is very important. Remember, T cell receptors can only bind to peptides presented by MHC molecules. And if a T cell cannot recognize MHC, it will not be able to react to pathogen antigens and it will not receive growth factors and will die. This process called positive selection. After positive selection, T cells are put through a process called negative selection, during which those T cells that are self-reactive to native peptides presented on MHC molecules would have the potential to target and destroy healthy human cells. Now, these self-reactive T cells undergo apoptosis. Non-self-reactive T cells will survive the negative selection process and proliferate. Now, notice that activities in the thymus declines with age, and B cells also undergo similar selection process in the bone marrow. When the immune cells cannot recognize self and non-self, it will lead to autoimmune diseases and hypersensitivity when the immune system is overreacted, and we'll discuss these uh, items in the later lectures in the series. Now let's look at the major receptors and co-receptors that are present in T cells and have a detailed look at how these receptors interact with the MHC molecule. We had a detailed look at the immunoglobulin in our previous lecture, so let's compare that to the T cell receptors. Both immunoglobulin and T cell receptors have antigen binding variable region and constant regions. And just like B cells, each clone only carry a single unique antigen receptor. In a sense, T cell receptor resembles a membrane-bound fab fragment. Now, besides these similarities, T cell receptors are quite different than immunoglobulins because they only bind to degraded peptides that is presented on MHC molecules. It is always membrane-bound to T cells and it does not gain diversity through somatic hypermutation. T cell receptor diversity is created by gene rearrangement or occurs during T cell development in the thymus. We also call this process somatic recombination. The mechanisms are similar to those of B cells. Therefore, junctional diversity also applies because recombinase cut the gene complexes in a staggered way, just like what happened in B cells. Now, but T cell receptors lack somatic hypermutation. Keep that in mind. And here is a recap of the big picture. 
T cell receptor can only recognize peptides that are broken down from larger protein structures, and that piece of peptide must be bound to an MHC molecule in order for a T cell receptor to recognize it. We previously talked about co-receptor clusters of differentiation, abbreviated as CD. Here we are introducing a new CD co-receptor that is present in all T cells during all stages of its development. Both CD4 and CD8 T cells have CD3, and CD3 is very specific to T cells and is involved in cell activations. But because it is so specific, it is often the target for some immunosuppressant anti T cell antibodies. Here is a recap to remind us that CD4 and CD8 are mutually exclusive glycoproteins that are co-expressed with T cell receptor. Mutually exclusive means when a T cell has CD8, it will not have CD4, and vice versa. In terms of their protein structures, CD4 has four extracellular immunoglobulin-like domains from D1 to D4, with a hinge between D2 and D3 domains. CD8 consists of an alpha and a beta chain, which both have an immunoglobulin-like domain that is connected to the membrane-spanning region by an extended stalk. Remember, T cell receptor can only recognize peptides that are presented on MHC. I'm repeating myself a lot in this lecture. So it is important that we take a closer look at both MHC1 and MHC2. MHC1 has a single transmembrane peptide chain with a non-covalent association with a macroglobulin. The MHC1 expressed in all nucleated cells. In contrast, MHC2 has two transmembrane peptide chains and is only expressed in antigen-presenting cells. The presented peptide binds to the groove and it is non-specific. The peptide binding site in an MHC molecule can bind peptides of many different amino acid sequences. This is a reminder slide that CD8 only interacts with MHC class 1 that present intracellular antigens, and CD4 interacts with MHC class 2 that present extracellular antigens. I mentioned previously, the interaction between the peptide and the peptide binding groove on MHC is nonspecific, and we call this promiscuous peptide binding groove. The amino acid side chains on the MHC molecule are important for making interaction with the peptide, which are shown in here in the picture. The dotted blue lines indicate hydrogen bonds and ionic interactions made between the peptide and the MHC molecule. MHC class 1 uh, in the figure, two ends of the peptide grabs by the popcat situated at the end of the groove, and the vast majority of peptides are between 8 to 10 amino acid in length. And in MHC class 2, the ends of the peptide are not pinned down into the pocket at each end, and as a consequence, they can extend out at each end of the groove and so can be much longer, so the peptides are usually between 13 to 25 in amino acid in length. Again, a reminder that extracellular antigens are brought into cells through endocytic vesicles after phagocytosis. The vesicle fuses with lysosomes to break down pathogens. This is the usual route to process bacterial peptides. And in all cells, proteosomes degrade cellular proteins that are poorly folded, damaged, unwanted, or foreign. And when a cell becomes infected by, for example, a virus, pathogen-derived proteins in the cytosol are also degraded by the proteosome. 
and peptides are transported from the cytosol to the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, abbreviated as ER, by the protein called transporter associated with antigen processing, abbreviated as TAP, which is embedded in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. The TAP is associated with MHC1 peptide presentation. Note that self-peptide and foreign peptides are displayed both via MHC class 1. In contrast, MHC class 2 is associated with a different protein called CLIP when they need to present peptides. The CLIP is an abbreviation of class 2 associated invariant chain peptide. Now, these CLIP molecules are identical in all individuals, and when there is no extracellular pathogen antigens, CLIPs bind to the peptide groove on MHC class 2. An MHC class 2 vesicle fused with endosome, a different HLA molecule called HLA-DM that resembles an MHC class 2 itself, but does not bind to peptide, would interact with MHC class 2, and causing the release of any loosely bound peptide. And when MHC class 2 is tightly bound to a peptide, it is exported to the plasma membrane surface to present that peptide and most often they are foreign peptide because MHC class 2 are exclusively on antigen presenting cells. We just mentioned the term HLA in our last slide, and HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen, which is another name for human MHC. Let's take a detailed look on that. MHC class 1 proteins form a functional receptor on nucleated cells of the body. Multiple similar genes encode HLA1 or MHC class 1 and HLA2 or we call it MHC class 2. Now there are three major and three minor MHC class 1 genes in HLA. HLAA, HLAB, and HLAC. And the minor genes are HLAE, HLAF, and HLAG. There are also three major, uh, which is the DP, DQ, and DR, and two minor, which is the DM and DO MHC class 2 proteins encoded by the HLA. Now, because of the presence of different alleles for the same gene within the population, it gives rise to polymorphism in the population. Now, many genes involved in the immune function are clustered closely on chromosome 6, and we get one chromosome, one from the mom, one from the dad. So MHC genes are inherited as a group or haplotype, one from each parent. And therefore, a heterozygous human inherits one parental and one maternal haplotype, each containing three major class 1, A, B, and C, and three major class 2, D, P, D, Q, and D, L low size, a total of six major class 1 and 2 alleles. We also inherit the five minor class 1 and class 2 alleles from the parents as well. Because MHC molecules is so polymorphic that most individuals are likely to be heterozygous at each locus, and alleles are expressed from both MHC haplotypes in any individuals, and the products of all alleles are found on all expressing cells. This is much like the co-dominance of the replica cell ABO markers, such as those AB type of type, they express both A antigen and B antigen, so it's a co-dominance factor. Now here is an example. Assuming that no crossing over occurs within the HLA regions of either the mom or the father's two uh, number six chromosome, now there are four possible combinations in which they may transmit their alleles to their children. So even if the parents carry different alleles at each locus, which is oftentimes the case, 
there is still one in a four chance that any of their children will be an exact match with another. Now, the problem is that、uh, it is difficult to find suitable donors for tissue transplantation. So, not even sibling will be a good match sometimes. MHC molecules diversity is focused in the region where peptide binding and T cell receptor interacts occur, also known as the peptide binding motif, which contains specific anchor residuals that bind peptide. Notice that MHC class one the variability is in the entire group, and in contrast, MHC class two the variability only displays in one chain in the beta chain. At the population level, MHC diversity appears to be under natural selection pressure. A few HLA types are universal amongst the entire population. It is believed that this increased diversity is usually advantageous for the species. For example, some HLA polymorphisms may result better resistant against a disease, but that is not always the case. To conclude this lecture, let's look at an interesting fact: when women are given a selection of men's sweaty T-shirts and asked which smells the most attractive to them, they pick T-shirts from men whose MHC set is most different from their own. Now, this may be a primal mechanism or instinct to choose a mate to produce progenies with MHC sets that are more diverse. The story doesn't end here. The women on birth control pills make a conscious choice not to conceive children at a given time. They cannot differentiate or discriminate the MHC differences from smelling T-shirts. Now、this makes me wonder what mechanisms could be behind that, right?